if you if we just categorize it as administration i think we're missing that that part that we've got to be really good administrators have got to be really good at working with people at communicating at winning hearts and, and drawing in and motivating around the gospel and, and how we can take the gospel out there so um so yeah i do do see it and i think our guys would see me in that role as you know a leadership role Welcome to Independence, the FIEC podcast. Uh, my name's Phil Topham, Executive Director of the FIEC. Uh, and with me today is Gavin Smith. Hello, Gavin. Hey, great to be here. Thanks Ga- for Gavin, inviting me. Gavin, tell us um, where you are and what it is that you do. Yeah, so I'm the church administrator, kind of church manager at Christ Church in Newport. And tell us a bit uh, about the church context there. Yeah, we've the church was planted 27 years ago with Pete Greasley. Uh, some folks might know him. Um, yeah, it came really came into reform theology. Wanted to church plant, have a church that was really based on the gospel. Um, so yeah, we we landed in Newport 27 years ago. I was a kid in the church, oh, grown wow. up. So you've gone all the so, way through the church. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'm just like the longest piece of furniture in the building. Um, yeah, been serving in the role for 19 years, kind of operations. You know, responsible for staff, building, finance keeping us legal, anything else that goes, you know, with an expanding ministry. So, um, yeah. yeah, People won't know, but the context is you've got a a large building, haven't you, that you do kind of rent out. It's used for lots of different things. Just give us a bit of a context there. Yeah, sure. Loads of, yeah, loads of things. We've got a big BT warehouse. It was, it's taken us 27 years to kind of develop it into something. Wow tidy uh something good um yeah so we've we we have a couple of uh, staff members who work on a kind of conference side of things so we have people who rent out the building you know mainly in the third sector nurses nhs teachers you know anything like that coming for training days so we get to host them which is great the church does quite a lot reaching into the community so with food bank and cap mm. m- you know projects with mums single mums um you know whatever we can do to take the gospel out there is is our passion i guess fantastic and what kind of size is the church because you're not part of FI. Are you see, are you no, yet, yet? I'll just not, put that in there. Not yet, yeah, yeah. not yet. But uh, I know it's on the agenda for the elders to talk about. So uh, excellent. We'll hold you to that. So we've, hold we've, it. we've got it now. You've got yeah. a date when yeah. it happens. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, what was the question? How, how many are you? Like, sort of size of oh, congregation? How many? Yeah. Are there, so we've got a, probably got about three hundred adults, something mm-hmm. like that, and then we've got kids, probably hundred and so kids. You know, it's really interesting since. Since COVID and the church is back, we seem to have a lot, lot more visitors. I don't know if that's happening across lots of churches, but yeah, we're getting sort of 40, 50 visitors a week, which is weird, Amazing. and but great. Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, though the church is thriving, doing well. Uh, we're just going through a kind of transition where Pete has been the senior you know, leader for, for the whole 27 years and is now sort of stepping into kind of just being part of the you know pastoral team. And um, you've got younger guys on the team. So yeah, some really interesting stuff happening. So. Doing well. Fantastic. So, so your church administrator. Yeah. Let's just think about that for a minute, because obviously a larger church, there's lots that needs doing in the background. We'll, we'll come on to perhaps talking about how um, that relates to a, a smaller church context. Mm-hmm. But, but first of all, let's talk about administration itself. So, administration is a spiritual gift, isn't it? But, it, it but is. it's not one of those we talk about very often. Why, why do you think that is? Joe, you know I don't know. I think the the default for ministry. You know, appointments. Sometimes you get a, a you know a senior pastor or a pastor, lead pastor, and they tend to go and appoint an assistant pastor, or they go down the road of a, a youth worker or someone in music, and, and we start to kind of roll out these things, and then we get to a point where we're like, oh right, we're growing too much. We might need someone in an administrative operation sort of role. And um, I really, from Pete's conviction in our place, he's always really kind of noticed and seen the gaps that there can be in ministry. And he's, you know, again, he'd say himself, he'd be aware of his own weaknesses. And so he he introduced me and my role, you know, fairly early on in the church. Um, and like I said, I've been serving in that 19 years. But I, I, I don't think that's typical. I think when churches get to like 200, 300, then they start to think about appointing someone. Um, but what's lovely is, you know, we're working with a couple of churches in Wales where they've they've got like a little admin team going that aren't mm. aren't paid, aren't you know, in a full time position or part time, but just have identified the gift of administration in their church. There's there's a bunch of people who love organising things that that that's their passion, that's where they really thrive, and you know, people have been able to identify that gifting, pull them together, and put them to good use. And I think it's, uh, I'd love to see more churches think about it and more leaders think about it in that way. So, so 19 years ago, the church would have been, lost my maths is rubbish, eight, ten, ten, 11 years old. Yeah. Yeah. So the church was 11 years old when you came in came as in. church administrator. And what kind of size was it then when the church took the decision to employ somebody as an administrator? Yeah, well, we had somebody before I did. I took over from somebody okay, else. Okay, so it's always called. been in the DNA yeah. of it. 
yeah, so within the first year, two years of the church, it was, yeah, the role was there. And I think it was seen as a kind of enabling role. So you can find people who are good with young people or music and things like that, but actually having an administrator across a, a wider kind of scope of the church could enable more ministry to happen. Um, and we, we find, you know, Pete would say himself, I was better at identifying people that could be released into different parts of ministry. You know, I was aware of their gifts maybe more than he might have been to kind of deploy them and say, actually, you're really good with working with older people. Let's, mm. would you serve in that area? Um, and so, so having an administrator, I think, on board or someone thinking like that, that kind of enabling ministry just is so helpful in the church to go, right, let's connect people to jobs. Let's connect people to ministry so, and, and see it thrive. So you, you started to answer that question a little, this question a little bit, I think, but it, it prompts me to ask, what is then your relationship as the administrator to the, the leadership, the eldership? So are you an elder? Are you a deacon? Are you yeah. none of the above? How, how, does that, how does that fit together in the way the church is set up? Yeah, that's right. So we've got a, a board of trustees that will be made of elders and, you know, folk in the church. And then we've got a, you know, we've got three elders who are paid and then we've got three lay elders. And so they would gather together. And then in terms of an actually operating team, we'd have a management team, which would be kind of me and the three other elders. And we would be really responsible for kind of managing the day-to-day -day running of the church. And so I would kind of fit into that kind of leadership team. Um, so I've been appointed as a deacon in the church mm. with a number of others. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, how we would, how we would see it fit together. And that works for the life of the church. It's a good, that's a good system, is it? Yeah, I think so. It, it works because I'm not there responsible for teaching. You know, I wouldn't be involved in any of teaching, um, you know, and very much see the elders setting the direction for the church. Yeah. And um, we often talk about like a boat in ours, you know, steering a boat, you know, I'm not responsible for the direction, but you need someone on board who goes, right, let's get the sails down here. Let's go in this, you know, let's, we need to do this. We need to work with this team. We need a new team to sort out this kind of maintenance on the ship. And, you know, and, and that's kind of my role is to kind of make things happen and get us mobile and get us going. And, um, and I love it. They love it because they're not having to think about these things, yeah. but they're thinking about ministry. They're thinking about prayer, the teaching, caring for people. And and that's that's what God's called them to do. So if I can release them to do what they've been called to do, then it's a win-win for me. Um, it strikes me very much that you consider this a ministry. This is not, you're, you're an administrator, yeah. but it's more than that for you. Is that a fair assessment? I think so, yeah. I, I think it's a leadership gift. I think it is. And I, I think it's... Um, if you if we just categorize it as administration, I think we're missing that that part that we've got to be really good. Administrators have got to be really good at working with people, at communicating, at winning hearts and, and drawing in and motivating around the gospel and, and how we can take the gospel out there. So um so yeah, I do do see it. And I think our guys would see me in that role as you know, a leadership role. And um yeah, I, I you know, I definitely have that sense of calling and I'm glad our guys on our team have got a broader sense of calling that you you know you don't just have to be a, a teaching pastor you know role typical role but actually there's wider uh, to have somebody in a kind of deacon role to have someone in this kind of operational functioning you know role so yeah it's it seems to work God has been very kind to us I yes. say and I've learned a lot of lessons made a lot of mistakes <laughs> as, as we've gone through it definitely fantastic now now one of the reasons we're talking today is because you and I have been having conversations over several months about something yeah. um, that you've set up called the church office. Yeah. Um, just tell us a little bit, first of all, what the church office is. It's, it's a website. We'll put the, the link in the show notes. Yeah. But what, what is it, first of all, Gavin? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's kind of started a number of years ago, sort of five, six years ago. Um, Pete's always encouraged us as a, as a fairly big church to, to serve other churches. And he's referred other leaders and other churches to me and said, would you go and help them do this and so we've had this informal sense of you know let's use the gifts that God's given us to serve other people and you know when the pandemic struck and you know suddenly my staff are furloughed the building needs yeah, less you, time you can't yeah you can't um, run the building out anymore uh, yeah your yeah. finances you're not spending anywhere near as what you were and so all of that changes I'm sitting there going I could do something here and so I, I give Pete a ring and I'm saying Pete I, you know I've had this heart to want to serve other churches I feel like if we put together an online resource, this might be a place where people can go and get stuff for their church that might help them. Things that we've already got in place, then that that would be a win-win. And so there was this real sense of how can we help pastors or elders who were in situations where they didn't have anyone in a the voluntary, they certainly probably didn't have anyone in a paid role, 
and we were we were just aware that there were there were ministers and, and elders who were just carrying a burden of administration that were seeing them going i'm not sure i can carry on and i'm hearing that thinking i can do something about this i i can put something together that would serve and um yeah so the church office was kind of you know the idea came together i was thinking there's so many things that go through the church office mm. and different ministries as well and buildings and kids and you know you start thinking about everything that goes through an office and goes back out to the church um it seemed like a good name so we we went with that and um basically just started sort of templating policies that we'd had for 15 20 years things that would we'd refined that we knew that was working for us and was thinking you know is there a pastor down the road that could just take a a loan policy worker, you know, thing mm. and apply that to their situation. So, so let me get this straight. You, you've built up a repertoire of policies at a church with a congregation of 300 plus every Sunday. You've built that up over 19 years yeah. and you've turned that into templates that other churches can use for their own situation. Yeah. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, brother. basically. And we've tried to kind of, I wanted to not only just serve elders, but how could we serve other people who are in a similar role to I? So on the on the website, you'll see it. There's articles to encourage people in our role, administration, mm. gift of administration. What does that look like? Um, I run a podcast that goes through just taking different topics that we would come across. And really that kind of behind the scenes ministry is how do we equip and support people who work behind the scenes mm. is really the heart. And how do we release the burden to, you know, enable pastors to do what God's called them to do? Um, and you'll, you'll see some training videos on there. Um, we've tried to connect in with some of the main, you know, different different organizations across, you know, the country that are being used, whether it be safeguarding yeah. or whether it be, you know, finances, you know, th there's topics that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis that, that we just thought, hey, we could do a podcast on this. We could talk about this and maybe equip somebody else to do mm. that in their church. So you've had guests on your podcast to do with like, safeguarding and finance. That, and there's yeah. other great organizations like ACAT who can help yeah. church treasures, that that kind of thing. So it's kind of a repository for all that that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. And it's been really, it's been really well taken up. We, we've been surprised at the numbers. I mean, God has to do something in this because you, you can put together an online resource, but you can't bring people to it. And I think we've had something like 24,000 users of it in the last two wow. years. Yeah. And um, from 134 different countries that have mm. come in, you know, so you can go on and look what policies they've downloaded in Nigeria or something like that. Mm. And you go, what, what is this? How is this possible? But but God's connecting people into it. And and what, I, what, I've, what I've realized is there's actually a real need to support people behind the scenes in ministry, um, whether that be an elder, whether that be somebody in our role who's functioning as an operations or church administrator. They, they need encouragement and support and and it might just be a bit of confidence so you you could log on and say i'm going to choose a you know policy on something we need something on maternity policy yeah. where do you start then take a look at the template you'll adapt it to what you mm -hmm. need you know you won't be able to agree with everything because it won't work in your context but it's a good starting point and i've had pastors that have come back to me and said Joe, it just gave me a little bit of confidence to know yeah. I was on the right track or mm. I wasn't on the right track. And, you, you know, you stepped in and, and what you had available was great. So, And how much are you charging me for it? How much are I charging you? Mate, it's free, isn't yeah. it? It's free. It's amazing. It's, it's, this is so generous. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. And, and me and my wife kind of like, we looked at it and we were like looking at the finances saying, do you know what, if we really believe that there's a need for this, you know, let's not go to the church and ask for money. Let's put the money in ourselves. And poor Emma was like, let's pour in our holiday fund oh. and we're going to raise this money and we're going to bless as many churches as we can mm -hmm. and um i think the, the site if you download a policy you get to subscribe and i think we've got something like over 650 churches that have subscribed that are using it mm. over 2000 policies downloaded mm. so it's just I, i'm blessed that people are using it and that it's making a difference and you know and I, I love the fact that we're talking more about how we can partner together absolutely how we can recommend it to churches because we think it's a great a great piece of work yeah. and let's zo zoom out a little bit so yeah. the church office is there as i say link, links in the show notes do have a look at that let's talk more widely about policies generally and yeah. charitable entities so all independent churches are charities by yeah. virtue of the fact that they're churches right so what kind of things do people need to be thinking about in terms of policies that they should have in place uh, how yeah. can we serve churches to think about what those kind of things might be yeah it's it's so so important isn't it and and you know on the charities commission we're, we're ticking boxes to say we've got a safeguarding policy that we've got employment policies and all of these things in place and and on my website there's kind of a there's a document on there that says like the nine essential policies and off the top of my head i'm not going to be able to remember sure. them um but you can you can log in and see right what do we need 
to run? What do we need if we're going to employ people? Um, but w- one of the things that you'll see over and over again in, in, on my website, and I keep saying it, and I've already said it to you today, mm-hmm. haven't I, that how do we connect the practical work of ministry and our policies and our buildings and all those things that we do behind the scenes? How do we connect them to the gospel? And um, I remember meeting a lady who was running a safeguarding uh, post in a church, small church, and she was just she came to one of my workshops and I said, every part of your ministry, every part of the work behind the scenes connects to the gospel. And she was like, I don't believe you. And you walked her through it. And uh, I just sat down and said, do you know what? Your work on safeguarding allows kids to come and hear the good news of Jesus. So you are enabling gospel ministry to happen through the work that you do. Mm. So the hassle when people don't bring their documents and they don't turn up at training and they, you know, all those things that you're working on, keep going, keep going because you are creating this place, this platform for kids to come and hear the good news of mm. Jesus. Mm. And then I said to her, you know, you're protecting the gospel. You know, when, when things yeah. go wrong yeah. in this area, yeah. they are so serious, aren't they? And so have such a bad impact on, on individuals' lives and on the church's ability then to, to share the gospel. Yeah. You are preventing that. And, and that is key for me. So we've got to draw those lines. And it was lovely to chat to the lady. She rang me back after the training. She said, I got up on Sunday and I connected safeguarding to the gospel at, at our church notices. Mm. She said, I've never had so many people come to the training before. Amazing. Because you framed yeah, it like yeah. that. Because yeah. you, and, 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 and that's so crucial for, for every different area of, of ministry. We want there to be excellence in the way that we do our work. We want to be able to care for our staff excellence. So we want to have the right policies that allow us to do that so we're not a distraction to the gospel or the work doing, being done. How, how do we um, answer the criticism that, that actually uh, policies uh, are not overly necessary? We just need to follow through with biblical principles with each other. And it's all, it's all there in the Bible, isn't it? How, how, do we, how do we answer that? Because what you've said there, I think, is, is that policies are drawn from our biblical yep. principles. Yep. So how, how, do, how do we answer that criticism? Yeah, it's, it's, we, we've got to frame it gospel. Otherwise, you know, without that, it lacks motivation and desire mm. to do it. Mm. You know, that, that is fundamental, that we want to create a safe environment for people to come and hear the gospel. What does that look like? And what does that look like for our staff, for our volunteers and all of those things? So there are biblical principles that we're drawing in to love one another, to protect one another, to care for one another. And, you know, we have to see that. And I think we've got to do the hard work of, you know, you know, helping our leaders to to value it in that way. So it's not just that we have to do this to tick a box, but actually this is part of the gospel. This is part of the work of the gospel. Um, and so there's some convincing on that. And I think there are smaller churches who would say, well, we've never had a safeguarding policy. We don't have any kids coming. Um, and, and you, you know, how do you answer that? Yeah. And it's, yeah. it's hard to answer that, isn't it? Mm. But actually the fact that what happens if God brings a family yeah. to your church on uh, Sunday? And safeguarding is broader than just children. And it is. Vulnerable yeah. adults as well. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're reaching into the community with food banks or with other areas you're trying to reach and help, then we, we need all of these things in, in place to protect ourselves and protect the gospel. So we've got to raise the agenda. And I, I do think churches are raising the standards and, and certainly the people that I'm speaking to behind the scenes, they are doing that and they see the need for it. But I think it's that first step of where do I go? What mm. do I need to do first? Do I trying to find somebody? Do I get them the training? Do we get the policy first? And, you know, there are organizations out there that will actually help you step by step walk through these things. You you mentioned smaller churches there, Gavin. It'd be good to just dwell there for a few minutes. So there'll be people listening to the pod who who are serving in a smaller church and just thinking, honestly, I I don't, I don't know where to start with some of this stuff. I've I've got a good, there's a good desire um, to, 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 you know, to get better policies in place. Yeah. What, what would you advise to somebody in, in that kind of situation? Yeah, I think the t- two things really. First one, I would say, you know, go, go and arrange a visit to another church. You know, that, that for me is one of the best ways to learn. You know, go and sit and, and, you know, meet with some of the other elders or even, you know, come and visit me in Christchurch and we can sit down and talk to you and say, here's the policies that we've got in place. This is the steps that we take. Um, you can go to our website, secondly, and download some of the policies that are available. Um, so that there is there is that sense of 
needing a, a first step. And I think if we can encourage people to take that first step of come to the website, you know, speak to FIC, you know, there are churches who are in similar situations. I, that's what I realize is that there's not anyone that's in a unique situation. So if by, you know, the strength of the network is that we can link, isn't it, with other churches. So get a coffee with someone and find out what they're doing. And, you know, you know, let's make sure, you know, if you're a treasurer listening to this, let's make sure that we create some budgets for people to to sign up to 318 or the other safeguarding company, you know, charities that are out there mm-hmm. that can enable them to do that. You know, there are people out there who have been doing this for 25, 30 years um, who can help us in those areas. So yeah. I also mentioned Christian safeguarding services as well as 318. Churches yeah. would, would use would use both. Again, links will, will go in the show notes to give you a, a helping hand with that. Um, just thinking about the smaller churches again then, what, what, what kind of, so if, if you go and meet with another church, you, you see what's going on there. Yeah. Um, they, they come to your website. How do they? How do people then engage with template policies to make them fit for purpose for their yeah. context? What would yeah. you advise churches to do? Yeah, I, I think about um, it, it's great to have some sort of. You know, we always encourage churches to have some sort of plan. What are, What are the ways that you're reaching into the community? What are some of the risks that are involved? Um, you know, have an idea of like almost like a church profile of what, what's our reach? What are we involved in? What do we need to protect? And what are what are important things to us? And that will shape the policies you choose. And that's going to shape the policies that you choose. You know, if you don't, if you're not employing anyone, then you, 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 you know, you're not going to need some of the employment policies, but you are going to need a safeguarding and you are going to need some other things, you know, some building policies, some health and safety things. You're going to need to have, um, you know, five-year electrical testing. You know, you need to check out your insurance and does it cover all those things? So there are, there's suddenly, uh, it feels like a, an overwhelming sense of, oh, I've got to do all this or this. But actually what you find is that if you can, you know, take a look at, we almost need like what a, a checklist, don't we? We almost need a checklist of what do I need for my church, my size, doing what we're doing. And our insurance companies actually is a really, really good, healthy place to start. And um, there are a number of churches that, that use easy Ecclesiastical, isn't yeah, it? I think. Yeah, ecclesiastical and, insurance. Um, yeah, yeah. They're, they're really good at advising, you know, from the, the building's perspective, from the health and safety perspective, they're useful. And again, you know, risk assessments are available on our site as little templates of what you could do. Um, you know, even things like a baptism risk assessment, people saying, do we need that? But mm. are you doing baptisms? And you, you want to be, you need one yeah. in place. And so you can download ours, take a look at it and think, right, what are we using here? We've got an old pool that's under the stage, right. You know, what do we need to do about water and Legionella in there? What about someone who's using a paddling pool? Mm. Uh, what are some of the, the safety things like that? You know, what are the, the manufacturing things that we need to follow here? What's, what, you know, what temperature should the water be? You know, suddenly you've got all these, all these questions, but, but taking a template gives you something to look at. It gives you a bit of confidence to say, okay, so we need to think about these things and then, you know, bring it into their context. Um, and I, I think there are there are places you can go, uh, you know, other churches, FIC, you know, drop me an email on the church office. There are some places that we can just easily signpost um, and get conversations going. This just sounds overwhelming. And we know the vast majority of our audience are church yeah. leaders, so so pastors, ministry leaders. Um, I think this just highlights the need to delegate some of this stuff. Yes. So how would you encourage yeah. a pastor to have a conversation with a man or woman in the church who might be able to lead on this area of administration for the wider body of Christ? Yeah, it's it's good, isn't it? Because I always feel like we have to um, convince leaders that this is you know yeah. needed. I, and um, one of the things that I've been sort of tuning over is one of the leaders said to me, "I don't I don't wake up at night thinking about." Um, Legionella in your baptistry. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, they're worried about other things. Um, so I do a simple exercise with a leader. Three three questions that I would kind of sit them down because saying, you know, do we need someone and trying to spin all these plates is saying, you know, what what do you need to continue? What is absolutely essential for you to do as called, as minister, as a leader for that church? Um, what are some of the things that you need to stop in three categories? And what are some of the things that you need to start? And if you start to put everything that you do into those three categories, you're going to find out actually what are some of your strengths and weaknesses? What are some of the needs that you need to actually begin to delegate out? Um, and what are, what room can you have to do some of the things that you need to start? Mm. And I've met so many leaders who get bogged down with all the, the administration and all this stuff that we're talking about well, here. Well, it's the immediacy of it, isn't yeah. it? It's the next thing on the table. So you want to deal with it right before you. But what you're suggesting is planning this out so yeah. you've got a, 
administration plan, essentially. Yeah, I mean, yeah, administration plan, what you can do and what you need to stop doing. So, I, I mean, I, I do this exercise quite regularly and uh, there are things on there. So I love I love a bargain, right? Love researching stuff, love to get something really cheap, you know? And it's, it's, it's a, a thing. It's only cheap if you need it. That yeah. would be my advice. <laughs> <laughs> and so... I, I love this. And um, so we need a new Hoover in church, right? I'm excited about this. I'm going to be the one who does the research, is, finds the best deal mm. and, and orders it. And, you know, it's on my, you really need to stop doing this list. Yeah. And um, as an example, there's a lady in our church who always seems to go on these exotic holidays and she gets them at really, really cheap prices. And she's a brilliant researcher. Mm. And so it's dawning on me, this is a need that I need to stop. Is this something that I pass down to somebody in our office, or is this actually something that I can give to a member who's brilliant at research? And finding bargains. And finding bargains. And I release that, and then that means that I can, you know, what room have I got in here? So I would encourage any leader to to do those. What do I need to continue? You know, what's essential? What can I stop? And then what do I need to start? Because there's always opportunities, and we want to leave capacity for opportunities. Mm. And I, I think if you can start to to put it down on paper, to frame it a little bit, those next steps are easier to find. Because when you're overwhelmed, you, you you don't know what the next thing is to do. You just know you have to do something, and the pressure's on for you to do something. But actually, if you can just go, I need to go. I need to find people for this, this, and this. I need to stop doing that. I need to continue this. We've got this opportunity to go and reach into the community. I need to give myself some time to do that. Yeah. Uh, what do we need to do that? You know, having having that kind of thinking, um, I think will serve people. And I think if you do that exercise, you'll realize you need some help. Um, and we, at the church office, we've been able to help churches put together little voluntary groups of people with gifting and administration research, things like that. Uh, we've helped a church appoint somebody on a part-time basis. Um, and we had a leader who was absolutely convinced of it. You know, he said, Gav, I'm absolutely sold that church administrator should be the next appointment for every church. Hmm. And I said, yes, I've done my job. Okay, <laughs> this is great. Um, and I said, you know, well, well, you know, prove it then. So, you know, he hires uh, somebody for four mornings a week. Hmm. And it's so wonderful to sit down and talk to him over a coffee the other day and he was saying, this has made a massive difference to our church. I didn't think it was going to make this much difference, but the church is happier. Mm -hmm. The church is better communicated. When people come in on Sunday, there's more order. I'm doing better in myself. I'm doing better in the work that God's called me to do. And you start going, this is great. And it doesn't have to be a paid person. It could be a volunteer, if even a smaller church, couldn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And one of the exercises I would regularly do is go through the church members list what do people do for their jobs? What are people passionate about? You know, um, I love to get to the new members classes. I don't do anything on the new members thing. I'm not teaching anything, but I'm there hearing and chatting to people and finding where can we deploy people in this? And and if you have somebody, you know, whether they're church administrator or not, or a different title, I think if you've got somebody who's thinking, enabling, mm. releasing, how can I do that? Um, you, your church is going to be healthier to have somebody like that. And I, I love that. So maybe your next hire should be an administrator. We, we've got to draw this Definitely. into got to draw this into land, Gavin. Um, just can you give us an idea of where you think churches are missing important policies? Which which, which kind of policies are churches not entertaining currently, yeah. which could cause them problems that you think they should immediately be thinking about? There are a couple of obvious yeah, ones. Yeah, Obviously, yeah. safeguarding yeah. is a legal requirement. But are there, are there any others that you just think churches would just be just be wise to, to think about yeah. getting hold of? I think when I started 20 years ago, I rarely met a church that had employment contracts for staff and various things. And I think that has hold, that you know that whole thing has changed. I think one one area that I'm concerned about is the whole kind of financial policy. Mm -hmm. So we we place a huge burden on, on treasurers and... Um, and I'm concerned for them. You know, one, one church leader was saying to me, you know, we, we we bring in a church treasurer, we keep him till he's about 75, and then we, you know, we take him out in a box. And and it's like, if that's how you treat treasurer, yeah. man, that is, there's something not right about mm -hmm. that. And just the, the policies related to finance and controls. So like investment, so internal financial controls, yeah. those, those kind of things. Just dual sign-offs, you know, yeah. who's who's involved in that, how you're dealing with cash. So, you know, what what's your, you know, general process of dealing with money? And think about that. And again, there's a there's a document on the website that goes, right, here's some ideas of things that you might consider or policies that you might want to write. You know, not all churches are taking, you know, cash now. Mm -hmm. um, so so I think the finance stuff is is worth, you know, investing some time into. What's what's the health of our treasurer like? Have we got enough protection in there for him and for those who are dealing with those financial procedures? And that's how it connects to the gospel, isn't it? Because it's yeah. a protection. Yeah. 
So, so you, yeah. you, you, you're wanting to be able to say this is whiter than white and here's the reason why, because we followed this policy that we've yeah. set up to protect our treasurer, to protect our church, to protect the donations of the people giving yeah. to the work of ministry. And that's how it connects. Yeah, it's huge. I think, I think every aspect of ministry behind the scenes connects. And I've got so many examples and stories that, that, that you just see beautiful connections where people go, ah, oh, I see it. And, you know, I think if we can link something practical to the gospel, that we get good at drawing a line and helping people to see the difference that they're making to the gospel being done. Uh, we will find volunteers motivated, people who just have got huge desire to serve, um, and we'll be, you know, employ, you know, enabling more people to be involved in the work of ministry. And um, that, that's an exciting for me. Gavin, it's been wonderful to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for chatting with us about administration. It is a spiritual gift. Uh, and Gavin, we are grateful to God for you and the work that you're doing at Christchurch Newport. Uh, safe travels home and uh, we'll speak to you again soon. If you've enjoyed the podcast, do rate, leave a review so others can find it. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.